We wish to acknowledge the Aboriginal people as the traditional owners of this land and we pay our respects to Elders past and present. Warning, this podcast contains sexually explicit material and is a safe space for all individuals to freely express themselves. Any information or advice provided comes from our own experiences and in no means should be taken as professional advice. We respect each individual and have zero tolerance for any rude or unsolicited behaviour. Hi, I'm Luna Wild and this is Project Slut with Wild Times, your podcast for everything BDSM and kink. Hello and welcome to the first episode of Wild Times. I'm your host, Luna Wild, and today we're going to be talking about the history of BDSM because I want to know what kinky shit people were getting up to in ancient times, and I'm sure you do too. Now, I know I sound sick, you're just going to have to forgive me, because I've been sick for the last week, but we're going to do this anyway. So what is BDSM? BDSM, as an acronym, stands for Bondage, Dominance, Submission, Slash Sadomasochism, and it usually involves partners taking on specific roles in which one is dominant and the other is submissive. This is not just limited to romantic relationships. This can be romantic relationships, casual relationships, professional relationships, but power play and power exchange are generally involved. The term BDSM was originally coined as an overarching term by Kinsey Institute collaborator Paul Gebhard in his essay Fetishism and Sadomasochism in 1969. Now, if you don't know what the Kinsey Institute is, It's the Institute for Sex Research run out of Indiana University that was founded by Alfred Charles Kinsey, an American sexologist, in 1947. So although BDSM came into populist purview in the late 60s, early 70s, BDSM itself, the behaviours, the sexual expression, have been around for a lot longer than that. And this is what I am going to get into. Starting us off, we have ancient Mesopotamia, about 12,000 years ago. And we have Inanna, which was the region's main deity. She's associated with love, beauty, sex, war, justice, and political power. And she was known as the Queen of Heaven. Historians have discovered cuneiform tablets depicting the ritual fetishization and worship of Inanna. Her subjects were whipped as they danced for her, enticing them into sexual frenzies, and a hymn about this deity mentions cross-dressing, altered states of consciousness, and rituals imbued with both pain and ecstasy. Perhaps the only thing you really need to know about Inanna is that while humans worshipped her, she also worshipped her own vulva and forced men, in particular, to bow to her in submission. This would technically make her history's first dominatrix. How sexy. The history of BDSM is really just so rich and so lush and filled with so many amazing stories. So, continuing on. Next we have Ancient Greece. So Ancient Greece had the Temple of Artemis, where young women would dance in a hypersexualized manner in reverence of the goddess Artemis. Young men would also run through the temple, being whipped and spanked by the priestesses of the temple, also in reverence of the goddess Artemis. In Greek religion, goddess Artemis was the goddess of wild animals, the hunt, vegetation, chastity and childbirth, the daughter of Zeus and Leto, and the twin sister of Apollo. Next up, we have ancient Italy. So ancient Italy had the tomb of floggings, which just sounds so cool to me. And this tomb was built around the 5th century and is believed to be dedicated to the god of wine and parties, Dionysus. The tomb itself, laden with sexually explicit imagery, including a wall painting of a woman being whipped by two men while in the throes of an erotic three-way tryst. How fun. Then we also have Pompeii and the more vanilla-named Villa of Mysteries. It shows a winged woman known as the Whipstress, which is a label slash title I would love to have, but I digress. So it shows the Whipstress, this angelic figure who initiated women into her secret cult through techniques akin to both bondage and flagellation, which suggest that whipping was more than just for punishment, it was also for sexual enjoyment. 
And now we have 15th century Japan. In 15th century Japan, there was a popular creative martial art known as Hoju Jutsu, which focused on rope restraint. And yes, people, this is the precursor to Shibari and Kimbaku. So Hoju Jutsu was used as a way of binding prisoners and punishing criminals. But interestingly, this bondage was more than just simply restraining enemies, and a lot of consideration went into the aesthetics of the ties, because a major tenant of the practice stated that in addition to restricting a prisoner's movement, the ties must also be pleasing to the eye, as the prisoners were also often publicly humiliated by being paraded while being bound. Like I said before, this is our precursor to Shibari Kinbaku. Now, those terms have been separated into shibari, which means tying, and kinbaku, which means tightly bound, and they're used interchangeably in the BDSM community, and I absolutely adore shibari and kinbaku. Some of the ties that people create are just so beautiful. It's a wonderful experience to be bound. I have had that happen myself. I love it. It's so cathartic, but this is not about me. I digress. Moving on to more recent times, we have Geoffrey Chaucer, who wrote the Canterbury Tales, but he also wrote the Miller's Tale, and this was released in the 1300s, and it touches on BDSM through writing about cuckolding. Basically, the Miller is a cuckold to his wife and her lover, which I just think is so sexy, it's so raunchy, especially for that time period. And then we also have Thomas Sadwell, The Virtuoso, John Cleland's Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure, which also included tales of whipping. And all of these stories created like this big intrigue into BDSM and these raunchy tales, which lasted well into the 1900s. Now, during the later part of that time period, we have Maki de Sade, who defined erotica in the late 1700s with his book, 120 Days of Sodom. Now this is classed as his masterpiece, and it resulted in the creation of the term sadist for the very first time. It was also the first systematic exploration of the psychopathology of sex. Psychopathology, referring to the scientific study of mental illness or disorders. So in this case, it would be the study of mental illness or disorders relating to sex. More modern psychoanalysts based their psychopathology of sex on, and a couple that come to mind would be Freud and Kinsey, as mentioned before. Now, the book itself, 120 Days of Sodom, has scenes depicting beating, forced orgasm, humiliation, group sex, role play, and knife play, among many others. And the work has been a source of outrage and scrutiny, both when it was released right up until modern times, even 2023. Quite a few feminists describe this work as being sexist, and other people just find it genuinely upsetting. I've read parts of this book, and I find it very intriguing, but I do also understand why people would find it disturbing. It is very full-on. It's quite graphic in its descriptions. It doesn't really take consent into account very often, if at all. But I would just suggest if you're curious, go read it. Formulate your own opinion and let me know what you think. Send me a DM on Instagram. Tell me what you think of the book. So stepping away from literature and looking now more at the societal expression of BDSM, we have post-World War I Germany during the Roaring Twenties. So this era saw jazz become a huge part of society. And with that came men in makeup, short-haired women in tuxedos, and these people frequented the nightclubs, and this blurred the line between gender all across Berlin. And this allowed the city's queer club scene to thrive, and it brought this sexual freedom into the mainstream, this gender-bending, fun expression of self. That was until Hitler's reign would force the entire LGBTQIA plus community into the shadows once again under fear of death because he held extremist right-wing views. After World War II and the end of the Third Reich, we're going deep on history now, folks, we find Germany once again stepped into its beautiful BDSM exploration and expression of self and sexual liberation. And Germany is what I consider to be 
the mecca of BDSM and kink. It's just so beautiful with all of the queer clubs they have, all of the fetish clubs they have, the BDSM and kink shops that you can go to, all of the latex shops that you can go to, all of the dungeons that are there, all of the domination and BDSM and kink courses, workshops, conventions that are run in Berlin. It's just incredible and I honestly cannot wait to go there and see all of this shit firsthand because it just makes me so damn excited. But I digress. Yet again, are we shocked? Not really. So, what about BDSM culture in America? Because they're not as liberal and free as their German counterparts, but BDSM culture in America has had a huge underground community that has given us BDSM and kink pioneers of their craft. First up, we have Charles Gayette, who is described as a pioneer of fetish style and was the first person in the USA to produce and distribute fetish art and photographs, some of which featured sadomasochistic content like bondage and whipping or spanking. And as a fetish fashion pioneer, Gayette also provided costumes shoes, boots, and the occasional photograph for publisher Robert Harrison, who was known for pin-up magazines. Those included Wink, Titter, Beauty Parade, Whisper, and Eiffel. And while I was researching this topic, looking at images from these magazines, the photographs are just, they're so beautiful. The women look just absolutely gorgeous. The poses are stunning. And overall, if you can get your hands on them or if you can find them on Google, I highly recommend checking them out because it's just incredible art, honestly. Although largely uncredited in his lifetime, Gayette was an incredibly important figure in the early fetish community and was the first martyr of fetish art in history, which means people just didn't understand what he was doing and he was ridiculed and sidelined for a lot of his creative life but he was a key influencer for all of the fetish art innovators who came after him, which included who I'm now going to talk about, Irving Claw. Now, Irving Claw is a self-proclaimed pin-up king and influential merchant of sexploitation, fetish, and Hollywood glamour through the mediums of pin-up photographs and films. So his contribution to the world was to commission fetish art, and he is responsible for the likes of Betty Page rising to fame, who is stunning. I love her. I'm obsessed. We'll get to her in a minute. For now, back to Claw. Instead of photographing himself, he would sponsor illustrative artists and he used his influence to promote the legacy of pioneers such as Charles Guyette and John Willie, who is our next BDSM influencer. So John Willie was an artist, he was a fetish photographer, and he was also an editor. He also published the first 20 issues of fetish magazine Bazaar, which you can still get copies of. And if you can, I recommend you would, because they are stunning. They are amazing. And these magazines often featured characters such as Sweet Gwendolyn and Sir Distic Darcy. So I'm like, I love a good pun. And these names just gave me such a good feeling. I love them so much. But back to the story. This was a strictly underground sex magazine, but it had such a far-reaching impact on later fetish-themed publications, and it even experienced a resurgence in popularity during the 1970s, and those are the copies that you can still get your hands on to this day. Willie is often attributed to pioneering modern BDSM and fetish styles, with contemporary looks still attributed to the scene today because some of the images produced by Willie overtly crossed into BDSM territory. He had models bound with ropes or leather behind their back or over their heads, models struggling against restraints or being beaten, and you can see a lot of that in modern BDSM photography. Bazaar was lucky with its content and it managed to avoid censorship despite the overarching fetish theme, because the publication didn't contain, quote-unquote, nudity, homosexuality, overt violence, or obvious depictions of things that might be read as perverse or immoral and that might rankle those parties 
who were capable of banning, censoring, or blocking circulation. So basically, they walked the line very, very well. And it was published right up until the late 1970s. And if you can get a copy of one, do it, because they're amazing and very, very worth it. Now, I mentioned her before, but we are now going to talk about the amazing, the one and only Betty Page. If you don't know who she is, you should go educate yourself or just keep listening to this because I'm going to educate you on how amazing she is. Basically, what you need to know is Betty Page was one of the most famous bizarre models on the roster and she is considered the queen of pinups and BDSM styles alike and she is largely attributed to revolutionizing sexuality for women. She's just so incredible. She had such a lasting impact on the industry especially when it comes to the relaxation of censorship on women. Before Betty Page turned up on the scene, there was this relegation of women to the sidelines with regards to what they could wear and how they could express themselves. So she became a real instigator behind women embracing their sexuality and their femininity, and she empowered women to make their own decisions on sexual preferences. And this led to a more healthy conversation around submissive and dominant behaviors for women. So women weren't just forced to be only in the submissive role anymore. If a woman wanted to express herself and express her dominance, then that became more okay, that became more mainstream. And it was because of Betty Page and her fellow pioneers that BDSM began to break free from the underground. And it made these small steps into becoming an artistic movement not only in America, but in the rest of the world as well. It became more to the forefront of society. Around the time society was becoming accustomed to Betty Page's fetish look, marginalized members were also starting to emerge from the underground. The gay leather movement actually came out in response to California's motorcycle culture, and it spawned the leather subculture in homosexual communities. With its overtly masculine themes, the leather movement directly countered society's preconceived notions about homosexuality and masculinity, with the movement itself becoming a powerful statement in the fight to normalize homosexuality. First up, we have the iconic Tauko Valio Larksonen, who is otherwise known as Tom of Finland. Tom of Finland is considered the most influential creator of gay pornographic images ever and I have to agree. If you haven't seen the images, you probably have. Honestly, they're the black and white, hand-drawn images of super masculine men in leather and motorcycle glasses and the caps and the big bulges in their pants. Amazing. I love them. So obviously he's best known for creating highly stylized and masculinized homoerotic art. And Tom of Finland's career spanned four decades, and all of these illustrations featured men with exaggerated dicks with tight or partially removed clothing. Oh, everyone went crazy for them. I go crazy for them. I'm not even a gay man and I love them. It's just beautiful. So Tom of Finland actually created an identity for BDSM and gay culture, where mainstream media at the time would frame gay men in this effeminate light. And it wasn't an effeminate light that actually celebrated homosexuality. It was used as a very subversive and degrading way against homosexual men rather than a celebration of their homosexuality and expression of selves. So Tom of Finland created this strong, powerful and self-assured works of art that showed the more masculine side of homosexuality and didn't deny homosexual men the ability to express themselves in that way because not every gay man is effeminate, just like not every gay man is hypermask. So we now have this beautiful dichotomy between the effeminate side and the masculine side, thanks to Tom of Finland. After Tom of Finland comes Robert Mapplethorpe. Now, like Tom of Finland, Mapplethorpe is attributed as one of the pioneers of the homosexual art scene. He came of age in New York City in the 1970s, and he played a pivotal role in bringing BDSM into the mainstream. And he did this by using his photography to shift trends in homosexuality 
and push back against the stereotype of the effeminate homosexual. At the time, and even now, Mapplethorpe is synonymous with obscenity, but that's not what the specific purpose of his work was. Instead, Mapplethorpe confronts his audience with bold images, many taken in the underground BDSM sex scene. And his work, however, it deviated from the heteronormative concept of BDSM, like Betty Page produced, and instead enabled him to create content a little bit harder, a little bit more intense, things that were not seen in the mainstream before the likes of Tom of Finland and Robert Mapplethorpe. Things like full-body latex, gags, full restriction and suffocation, very tight bondage, very intense impact play, all of which was very beautifully shot, very classy, very elegant, and inspired a lot of modern BDSM and fetish art. Coming into the modern era of BDSM and kink, recently we've seen BDSM and kink actually come into the realm of artists pushing the boundaries of society's comfort through film, photography, fashion, and exposing us all to scenes that were once kept exclusively underground just for those who knew. Perfect example is like in the 1990s with Nine Inch Nails and Marilyn Manson, who used BDSM as the baseline for their looks and their modes of artistic expression with how they dressed, the lyrics they wrote about, their film clips. Even more recently, we have the likes of Kim Petras and Lady Gaga, even Ariana Grande, who wear full-body latex to awards shows or during their live performances and their concerts. We have TV shows like Bonding that are readily available on Netflix. BDSM now is just becoming part of our mainstream culture. I personally love that BDSM and kink and sex is more okay in today's society. It's more prevalent in the conversation. It allows us to create podcasts like this where we can educate and talk about things that were previously taboo. It gives people more strength. It empowers people it educates people. We're more knowledgeable now. And that's just such a beautiful thing. Because if this brief history of BDSM has shown us anything, it's that fluidity of gender and sexual expression should be celebrated. BDSM isn't some nefarious, evil subculture hell-bent on destroying society. And it's definitely not a culture best kept underground away from prying eyes. Like, we're not Satan worshippers over here. We're just kinky people wanting to get our rocks off. And BDSM is a subculture with an incredibly rich and important history. And there's no incorrect way to express sex, gender, or sexuality. It's all good as long as it's consensual. Because consent is sexy, people. Anyway, that's it from me today. I hope you enjoyed this brief history of BDSM as the very first episode of Wild Times. Enjoy yourself, stay safe, stay sexy, and I will see you all again on the next episode. Bye.